Welcome to Peoples and Things, a podcast about human life with technology. I'm your host, Lee Vinsel, an associate professor of science, technology, and society at Virginia Tech. You can reach me with comments and suggestions at leevinsel at gmail.com or on Twitter at STS underscore news. I would love to hear from you. There's a kind of myth that you find, especially in the United States and especially in libertarian circles, that there were some good old days, some golden glory years before government got its sticky regulatory fingers involved in business and technology. It's the idea, for example, that the 19th century was a period of laissez-faire capitalism where everything was an unregulated frontier, kind of like a cowboy movie. This idea is dead wrong and is premised on bad history, and scholars have been showing it is wrong for decades now. But I think one of the best examinations of how wrong this myth is is Richard John's book, Network Nation, Inventing American Telecommunications. Network Nation is a history of the telegraph and telephone in the United States. Richard, who is a historian and professor of journalism at Columbia University, demonstrates that from the very beginning of these technologies, thinking about the state and regulation and ideas of political economy was at the heart of business strategy. Inventors and entrepreneurs like Samuel Morse and Alexander Graham Bell had to think through and contend with the state and visions of good governance as they work to build their technological systems. And here is something else the libertarian myth often misses about the history of technology. Much of this regulation took place at the state and especially local municipal level rather than at the federal level of government, which is directly counter to how the federal level gets so much attention in conversation and in scholarship. To be clear, Correcting the history of government, regulation, and technology is only one door into Network Nation, which is a great and at times dense book. And I think you'll enjoy listening to Richard, who is a wise person and one of the most knowledgeable and encyclopedic scholars I've ever known. I had a lot of fun with him, as you'll see. Get excited. Richard, thanks so much for talking to me today. Well, thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to it. So Network Nation is a, is a big history of telecommunications, but when you, when you talk to strangers about it, what do, you, what do you say it's about? I will tell strangers that almost everybody thinks about the telegraph and the telephone, which is what the book's about, backward from the present to the past. Whereas I try to tell the story of the telegraph and the telephone forward, from the 18th century. So my the, the bulk of the book is 1840 to 1920. I'm telling the story forward rather than backward. And when you say that, is it when 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 we go forward, is is it about the other things that could have happened? Is it about not seeing kind of where we ended up in that history? That's a great question. Um it's not really a book about counterfactuals. We could have done mm. this or we could have done that, but it's yeah. how we got to a moment, the early 20th century, when we have an electrically mediated uh, communication network, telephony, which is 
by uh, profession of the managers of the companies that run it meant to be accessible to everyone as a matter mm -hmm. of right and not a privilege. So how did we get there? Mm -hmm. And we got there not because of uh, the technical attributes of the telephone, uh, yeah. not because of anything uh, intrinsic to communications, but because of governmental institutions and civic ideals, or to use a kind of ungainly phrase, political economy. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a comparative case study where the contrast is not what could have been, but wasn't. But the contrast instead is what happens when you have one political economy, what mm -hmm. they call an anti-monopoly political economy, and that gives you the telegraph. You have a progressive political economy and that gives you the telephone. Mm -hmm. And I trace three stages, communication, uh, commercialization, popularization, and naturalization. And it turns out the sequencing of those three stages is different for the telegraph and the telephone. Um, we could talk about that if you'd like. Yeah. yeah. Um, this might sound rude. I don't mean it to be rude, but there were a lot of books on, uh, you know, the history of the telegraph and the telephone, you yeah. know, that have been written over the years. I'm sure there's there's even histories that probably cover both of them. Right. But mm -hmm. what did you feel like was missing when when you when you when you started this project? A lot was missing. Um, there's a propensity to write about the telegraph and the telephone using books that other people have written. Mm -hmm. uh, that's true for Al Chandler. He wrote about the telegraph. That's true for Tim Wu when he wrote about the telephone. And both of them get the story really, really badly wrong. Hmm. Uh, and the reason they get it wrong uh, is pretty simple, that there are archival records and primary source materials that they didn't look at. Uh, mm -hmm. In the case of Al Chandler, were not accessible. He followed Robert Luther Thompson's history of the telegraph. And Robert mm -hmm. Luther Thompson and I can appreciate this. He started in the 1830s. And he just got exhausted by the time he got to 1866. He wanted to get off stage, end his book. So he said, oh, Telegraph's a natural monopoly in 1866. And that's the end of the story. He washed his hands of it. And for Tim Wu, he, he was writing about heroic inventors and geniuses who are crushed by powerful entities, which is a very old and tired narrative. And yeah. it basically ended up reinforcing at and Bell system, public relations uh, <laughs> uh, propaganda. He just fell right into the narrative yeah. that they had told. So in fact, there was a great deal. And I couldn't do it all myself. Uh, David Hochfelder did a very fine book uh, on the telegraph. Um, Chris Beecham on uh, telephone patents. Uh, Robert McDougall did a splendid book on uh, kind of the comparative study of the telephone in, in middle-sized towns in the United States. Um, and Canada, and I'm, I'm worried, oh, Josh uh, Wolf, a, a book on business strategy of Western Union. In other words, there was a bunch of us yeah. who were working. And the, the two things, you say, what did we do that others hadn't done? The Western Union archives were open at the Smithsonian, and we worked okay. very extensively in those archives. And the AT&T archive in San Antonio, Texas, which had the records of the telephone operating companies, was opened when I was about halfway through the research. Initially, wow. I was kind of terrified and, and I, I, I was, uh, you know, I don't know, demoralized by the fact there's this archive as big as an airplane hangar that just opened up yeah. on television. <laughs> but yeah. working in that archive completely transformed uh, the perspective of my book, as it did uh, for Robert McDougall in his very good book, uh, The People's Network. Yeah, our two nice. books in some ways are complementary. So that that's a long answer to yeah. a short question. Um, no. if, if you really care about what happened, as yeah. opposed to what PR <laughs> uh, Black <laughs> said, you've got to read the book by the most recent generations. Otherwise, you're just regurgitating, yeah. um, you know, what the corporate moguls want you to believe. And I don't believe. I think there's a problem in history, kind of more broadly, right? That we come to rely on other people's narratives and. Mm -hmm. Don't go back to the sources. And we find this over and over again. It's kind of a perennial problem. It really is. And you can't go back to the sources on everything. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I, I did write about two of the biggest organizations in the world over an 80 year period. And I tried right. to master, you know, corpus of primary sources. And that's that's a lot of work. But it was yeah. a team of us working on it together. And I did focus on a very specific problem which was, in effect, how do governmental institutions and civic ideals shape 
business strategy. And I, I was there responding, I hope, in an appreciative way to my mentor, Alfred Chandler, who, who, who famously contended that business strategy shaped organizational structure within the corporation. And I contended that the political structure of yeah. the governmental institution, civic ideals of the political economy, as it were, shaped business strategy. So that yeah. that that was really the the main focus of that book. Though I tried to have a lot of you know a lot of people, a lot of stories to make it interesting for general readers who were willing to read a pretty long book about the telegraph and the telephone. Yeah, uh, you know that was what you were just saying about kind of politics and and culture versus kind of the economics and technology. Is something I wanted to talk to you about. So. I mean, where were where was the state and political economy and regulation and these topics in business history when you came into the field in I don't know the eighties? Am I yeah. right? Yeah, well, I was editor of Business History Review for for four years, May three to eighty seven, and I worked with Al Chandler and Tom McCraw. And Tom McCraw, in fact, won the Pulitzer Prize for Profits of Regulation when I was at Harvard. So mm. uh, you were not allowed to talk about the state um, yeah. in history departments at that time. That was considered verboten. And Theda Scotchpole was a young Turk, and she was talking about the state. She was one of the first uh, really social scientists who was interested in my work. I'm very, very grateful to Theda, always, always will be. So the, the model was really pretty simple, that you had technology, which was this just yes. force that was propelling <laughs> itself through time. And that was Chandler's basic insight. You know, you could see it in Marx. You could see it, um, you, you could see it in Schumpeter. Yeah. Um, and then governmental institutions come in either to tidy things up or to muck it up. Uh, and, and, and I would put Tom Hughes in the muck it up category, a uh, historian mm -hmm. of technology. Um, if you look at Tom Hughes's work, for example, on electric power, uh, you have electric power stations and then it gets in, embroiled in regulation. Yeah. Uh, and then it gets bigger and then you know, it gets embroiled in different regulatory arena. And I, I just don't think that's a sensible way to tell the story at all. But that was the way yeah. the story was told. Regulation, government uh, intervention comes in late. And there's always the claim, oh, technology is so complicated and so novel that the government yeah, yeah. can't possibly <laughs> figure it out. Yeah. So it, it's yeah. got to be done. Uh, you've got to be ginger about it. And then outcomes are unintended. Mm. Of course, Antitrust led to more consolidation. That was a claim that was made. So that was yeah. that was more or less the playing ground. Chandler says almost nothing about political economy in visible hand. And Tom McCraw's subject was regulatory agencies, but his great claim was the regulatory agencies can't do very much because they can't alter uh, this fundamental structure of an industry. And the fundamental structure is defined by technology and economics. Yeah. And one thing I tried to demonstrate in Network Nation is that's just not true. That's really fascinating. Um, my colleague here at Virginia Tech, Matt Wisnowski, has written about kind of the ideology of technology as this kind of force, uh, you know, kind of neutral force almost. And I, you know, I think that a lot of that generation of historians were very tapped into that kind of right. 50s and 60s ideology of technology. It was very built into their, um, you know, just their worldview, I think, and, and hard for them to see other alternatives. It, it goes back before the 50s, um, mm -hmm. Babylon uh, and yeah. Charles Beard. If you read Charles Beard's presidential address for the American Political Science Association, it mm -hmm. is a uh, flat out star spangled banner uh, pay and technological determinism. I was really startled yeah. when I first saw that. So it, it's a it, it starts in the really the teens and 20s. Of course, corporate public relations at Bell pushes it along. And then by the time you get to the 1950s, yeah, you know, it's it's just that it's high tie. And for Chandler. And I don't think this is sufficiently appreciated. Emphasizing technology was a way of really tweaking the lion's tail. It was a way of criticizing the British. Uh, that, uh, you know, Second World War, it was United States technological uh, virtuosity that won the war. And that Britain yeah. almost blew it. And, and so there was, a, there was a political logic behind yeah. Chandler's um, uh, admiration for and, and, and almost reverence toward the power of, of technology. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a narrowly uh, technocratic vision. It was, it was more like, a, this is really the way the world works. And if you don't believe that, then you are, are never going to understand modernity. And I, I, when, I, you know, when I first read Chandler, right after it came out, I was the son of a rocket scientist um, who later worked as a 
policy planner, administrator in R&D in the federal government. Um, that made sense to me. A lot of American history was just about one damn presidential election after another. Mm -hmm. um, or it was mm -hmm. about one you know, cultural trend or one social group that was embittered and losing. But th there was a sense that if you wanted to study what was central and what was important, that you needed to pay attention to what we now call technology. And, and Chandler's visible hand just opened that whole subject up. Yeah. In, in like no previous book in American history. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so I want to give people a little bit um, uh, a, a sense of who you are and your background. So, you know, maybe the, I could actually I could uh, ask a question that's actually a bit more rude and say you once wrote uh, a history of the post office. So yeah. my two part question is, why would anyone want to do that, first of all? <laughs> and how how is that history connected to the one in Network Nation? Because I, I don't think yeah. these are disconnected things for you. No, they're not. Uh, why would anyone write a history of the public? It was considered by one of my uh, Harvard professors as the worst possible dissertation topic. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was, that was something. I think that's, by the way, a good thing for dissertation writers, to write about a topic that everybody thinks is a bad topic. You have to explain to yourself and others why it mattered. But it was really yeah. pretty straightforward. Uh, I came to graduate school in the history of American civilization at Harvard in 1981, interested in uh, failure. And uh, in it was 1970s, 1980s. Um, I wrote an undergraduate thesis on the decline of the New England cotton textile industry. Uh, we wrote a lot about winners in American history. What about the losers? And well, how do you write about failure? And I got interested in bureaucratic fatalism for personal reasons. Huh. Um, and that was the sub. So, so I wanted to write a book like Leo Marx's Machine in the Garden for bureaucracy. So, uh, you know, what did you could you could do either what a small number of writers thought about a lot of bureaucracies or what yeah. a wider range of Americans thought about a single bureaucracy. And it just so happens that David Donald gave a lecture one day in which he said that the first American bureaucracy was the post office. And, you know, you'd like to get back to the beginning. as a graduate yeah. student. And I had an interest because of my personal background in the early republic. So, aha, I bet a lot of Americans had opinions about the post office. So I could see if, you know, bureaucratic fatalism set in or what, you know, and then I discovered yeah. that really not very many Americans were fatalistic about. It. So I did an essay on um, Bartleby the Scrivener by Herman and Melville, which is often seen as a locus classicus of, of bureaucratic fatalism. But I concluded it had nothing to do with that. In fact, Bartleby had a good job in the post office, lost his good job in the post office, couldn't make up his lost income as a peace worker in a, in, for a law clerk and got despondent. He was probably still reflecting on uh, how he had been badly treated by getting bounced and he wouldn't be able to get a letter of recommendation because you'd have to <laughs> pretend that he was thrown out of office because he'd fiddled the books. And that was the last I ever did on bureaucratic fatalism. Um, hmm. I decided, you know, and, no, and uh, the essay is politely received, but I went in a different direction because I got very interested in how the thing worked. Um, hmm. and, and that was something that I hadn't... Uh, anticipated writing on because after all it's kind of hard it's easier to write about what people thought about something than to yeah. write about how something actually worked and then i i just went down the rabbit hole of figuring out how information moved around mm -hmm. and that got me to daniel bell who was lecturing on 20th century communications i learned about the bias of communication in harold innes and i was off and running so yeah it seems like a really bizarre peculiar topic but it was by far the biggest employer in the federal government it was uh, the wellspring of, of political democracy in the sense that it was the source of employment for both political parties. Uh, it created a nationwide market, and, and it became kind of the, the underpinning for uh, voluntary associations. But what was most interesting, and I, I know your, your viewers probably not that interested in the post office as I am, what was most interesting about it was that it, it was a very distinctive, peculiar project. There was a legislative hmm. mandate to expand access to information by giving Congress control over the designation of new routes, by admitting newspapers into the mail at very, very low rates, and hmm. by establishing a surveillance standard that prevented anyone in the government from peeking into your letters. So you got a rate structure, development a strategy, surveillance standard that was distinctive. And it was yeah. different from what any other country had. So you go from the world of James Madison, where he assumed that lawmakers would meet with their with this with their constituents 
and the lawmakers went home, to the world of Lexus de Tocqueville, where it's taken for granted that newspapers are j j just uh, blanketing the country. And huh. that didn't just happen. That was a result of public policy. And that is the last thing I'll say. That became very helpful in writing about the telegraph on the telephone because the post office was the before yeah. to my story of the after, the telegraph and the telephone. And then, so what was the connection? I mean, how did you move from that, you know, the, the post office book spreading the news to to telecommunication? Was it just a natural extension then you know, of becoming interested in communications? It, it was kind of, you know, you've written a book on a communication network that you think really important is really important that yeah. nobody else really cares about. You can yeah. really try and try and try to get other people interested. And, you know, Dan Howe won the Pulitzer Prize for What Hath God Wrought, the post office is central, and, and Paul Starr made a big deal of it in his creation of the media. So that, and the book's still in print, you know, the idea of the post office was really important is now out there, and it's a subject yeah. I want to return to. But let's face it, um, I was a business historian, and I wrote about the post office, so that seems strange. So let's write about a business that, you know, everybody knows was important. So that yeah. would be Western Union and the Bell System, or as I came to think of it, the operating companies that make up the Bell System. Mm -hmm. And I would have an advantage, I thought, because I knew what had happened before, so I could tell the story going forward. And it turns out that that was, that was true. I had no idea what a challenge it was going to be yeah. to, to wrestle the telegraph and the telephone to the ground. But that was the basic idea. There was, certain, there was a certain civic, there were governmental institutions and civic ideals that shaped the information infrastructure in the early republic. How did governmental institutions and civic ideals shape the information infrastructure of the industrial nation? Mm -hmm. that, that's how those two uh, yeah. books really, really, it's two books, three networks, how they fit together. It's If you're interested in the history of American communications up to the, the First World War from the Enlightenment, I think those three books provide you with an introduction. Mm -hmm. um so among other stories readers learn in Network Nation is that Postmaster General Amos Kendall, uh, who managed Samuel Morse's intellectual property around the telegraph, mm -hmm. originally wanted to sell the technology to the U.S. Congress, that it would be kind of a state owned or national system. So why was that? Why did that option make, you know, that to I think to our ears or eyes, that makes this seems very strange. But why? Why was that something that made sense at the moment? Right. It not only made sense it was the only option. In other words, I read the press. I read every newspaper account from 1843 to 1848 dealing with the telegraph. And there's almost unanimous support for the government mm -hmm. takeover of the telegraph until I think some point in 1846. So here's why. One, Morse, who has the patents, he got key patents in 1840. Patent commissioner blocks the Brits, Cook and Wheatstone, from getting a comparable patent. Cook and Wheatstone are doing very nicely in Britain because the railroads are adopting the telegraph right away. So why we don't talk about Cook and Wheatstone as the inventors of the telegraph? They invented a working telegraph system for the railroads that was in place long before 1845. But Morse comes up with this idea, which is, it's really not that complicated an idea. And the key is the Danielle battery that just come in in the 1830s. So someone was going to do it. It happens to be Morse. He has a very close relationship with his Yale classmate, uh, Henry Levitt Ellsworth, who is the patent commissioner. The patent commissioner wants to show that the patent office is good for something. So they, they give Morris not only a patent, but a very strong patent. They beat off rivals like Cook and Wheatstone. So he's now got the patent. And then he gets money from Congress in order to build an experimental line. Well, this is under the glare of publicity. Morris mm -hmm. is, you probably say, clinically paranoid. He, that he, he, he's fearful that if the lines go overhead, lines go overhead, that uh, someone's going to sabotage, sabotage. Uh, yeah. You know, someone's going to destroy the term sabotage. wouldn't use it at the time. Someone's going to destroy it. The Russians mm -hmm. felt the same way. So you got to put the lines underground, which is expensive. And then he had to, he hires this um, itinerant plow salesman, a fellow named uh, Ezra Cornell, because he knew how to dig, Ditches. Yeah. So they're going to put the wires underground. But to make a long story short, they barely get it done. Congress is not that impressed with it. Uh, and they don't want to buy it out. But yeah. you've got this ideological problem because Morse very much wanted to sell because he told the country that if private firms had control over the electric telegraph, 
that this would become a speculative bonanza. And mm -hmm. in fact, we need to run it like the post office because mm -hmm. the post office was regarded as, as, as a, a sort of a fair uh, party. It, it, mm -hmm. it was, and in fact, under a uh, predecessor to the Postmaster General in 1845, uh, the government actually claimed, Postmaster General claimed that the government should circulate information on commercial matters so that it would be equally accessible to everyone at the same time, which is something mm -hmm. that's kind of hard to imagine the government yeah. actually doing, but they made that claim. McLean made that claim. So the idea that you could have speculation if the government doesn't own and operate the network was just taken for granted at that time, 1845. Mm -hmm. But then Congress doesn't, doesn't go ahead. And then Kendall has got to figure out a way to commercialize it. And of course, he not only was Morse's business agent, as I think you said, he'd been former postmaster general. So his idea is to replicate the postal network hmm. as telegraph. And he does it not only by building a line to New Orleans, which he thinks is the big market for cotton information, of course, for the Liverpool market. But he also thinks that we got to rely on the federal government to prevent outsiders from challenging us. So he defends the patent rights at the federal level. And that turns out to be a disastrous strategy. But that was the strategy of the first generation of telegraph promoters, Morse and Kendall. So even though the government doesn't take it over, Kendall has this vision that it's yeah. going to be sort of federally regulated through patent rights. The second generation, yeah. completely different. I think that answers your... Yeah. So it's it's uh, very hard for a 20th century, 21st century audience to understand why anybody thought of nationalizing the telegraph. It was very hard in 1845 to imagine anything but a government telegraph. Yeah. Yeah. It, so let's bring Western Union in. So, I mean, I, for a while here, you have this kind of competition yeah. between the two, but then Western Union really just like swamps out the Morse right. group. So, I mean, you know, t say a bit about that story. And also it allows you to kind of draw out some of the themes you're interested in. Western Union is a second generation telegraph network provider. Morse is the first generation. Morse's network is north-south and it's reliant on patent rights. Western Union is east-west. It doesn't start in New York City, though that's where its, cap where its headquarters would be. It, it started in Rochester, New York. Hmm. You had merchants with a fair amount of money and they recognized the importance of east-west connections. Remember that Morse network originally north-south. East-West connection. They're thinking about the market for grain in Europe. Mm -hmm. so instead of cotton, grain. Now, they recognize, the second generation, Hiram Sibley among them, that it's very hard to prevent insurgents using patent rights. Morse yeah. had trouble. There were many other rivals. It's very difficult to control a market using patents. So they hit upon a different strategy. And the different strategy is, let's contract ex for exclusive right-of-way agreements with railroads. Mm -hmm. And this is so different from what happened in Britain. In Britain, the railroad was actually a major source of revenue for a cook and wheatstone. In the United States, it wasn't a source of revenue at all. In fact, the messages that sent over the railroad for the railroad all went free of charge. Mm -hmm. But what the telegraph company got was the exclusive access to the right of way, which is much, much cheaper yeah. than having to string wires over open ground. Not only because you string wires over open ground, you got to negotiate with a lot of people, but also if you string wires over open ground, how, what are you going to do when the, when the wires break? Yeah. You got to get someone out in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania or Ohio. Mm -hmm. If it's if it's along the railroad, it's relatively easy to fix it. Uh, it's a, it's a main <laughs> yeah, yeah. Never, the maintenance it's a problem. Maintenance problem. I yeah. never thought of that. It's good. Um, so so Western Union then goes east west, and of course the situation could have been different if we hadn't had that unpleasantness in the 1860s, the Civil War. Mm -hmm. It's not so good for north-south telegraph lines <laughs> during the Civil War. Yeah. The east-west line, which went through, you know, territory controlled by the Union, uh, for the most part, they have lines in the south, but it's basically an east-west line. Um, that put them in a much stronger position. Mm -hmm. And it, it was called, this is the last thing, it was called the Western Union, often, mm -hmm. not just Western Union. 
In other words, it was the union huh. of the seaboard and the yeah. West. Uh huh. Yeah. Something, I mean, this issue of exclusive access and, mm -hmm. and patents, I mean, so something you point out throughout the book is that the anti-monopoly tradition is really important during this early mm -hmm. period. So where do you, where in the records do you first see this kind of, you know, the his, in the, this history of telecommunications where anti-monopoly comes up and, you know, where, how do we get to the notion of natural monopoly, which, you know, kind of comes to cover utilities in general in a lot of places? New York Telegraph Act of 1848. And, and here's the story. Samuel Morse gives the license for the first telegraph line to link New York City with its environs to a small arms manufacturer named Samuel Colt. Uh -huh. He gives it to Colt because he was impressed with Colt. Why is he impressed with Colt? Because Colt can blow up things in the water. He can blow up, he's mm. a pyromaniac. He <laughs> lies, it's called a torpedo. You have this wire between a ship and the shore. You, you hit a lever and the ship blows up. The torpedo is not something that, that moves. Yeah. The torpedo is something you attach to a ship. Now what impressed Morse, aha, he knows how to insulate a wire underwater. Because mm -hmm. that was not obvious. Um, yeah. And it was really hard to do. It's even hard to put wires underground, right? And of course, yeah. the early, I should have said this before, but the early telegraph wires, after the failure with the, well, almost failure, almost disaster with Congress, they now put the wires all over ground. Um, but with water, you know, you can put it on masts, but you really want to be able to put it underwater. New York City is surrounded by the Hudson and the East River, right? Yeah. So you get cold. Now, cold says to the whole world, my company, is going to make it possible for information to circulate from New Orleans to New York faster than any newspaper and back and forth. So therefore, he says all the newspapers are going to go out of business. That the new technology, he doesn't use the word technology, but this new yeah. device is going to make the newspaper obsolete. They're going to have to, going to have to, and journalists said the same thing. We're going to have to fill our newspaper with philosophical disquisitions. <laughs> you know, the, the telegraph has done us in. Yeah. So, Journalists get together and fight back. I, I, I present this as a problem to my journalism students. What would you do if a new media emerges that's undermining yeah. your business model? <laughs> and then they sit around and try to figure out what, you know, what would they do? You know, yeah. you can, you can badmouth them. You can, you know, you can, uh, but they say, no, what you want to do is try to change the law, <laughs> change the law. And so how do you do that? Well, Brooks, who was one of the editors, oh, I skipped a step, sorry. The first thing you do is you form an association. And the association was the New York Associated Press. And as an association that protect the collective interest of your newspapers, okay? One of the members was James Brooks, who was an editor of the, of the New York Express. So he goes to Albany for one session. This is not well documented, but it's during that one section, one session that they enact the New York Telegraph Act of 1848. And you, you can infer that Brooks has something to do with it. Is it certainly a pro New York City newspaper law? Why? It makes it very easy for new telegraph companies to get access to rights of way, which is to kind of break the uh, break the, the monopoly of Morse. You can't do anything really with patent law, but it also provides preferential rates and access to the newspapers. And what the New York Associated Press then does is it becomes the certifier for financial information. In other words, if you get financial information in a New York Associated Press paper, you're not going to be subject to some kind of speculative scam, fake news. You're gonna be free of fake news, New York, so you gotta buy our newspapers. And that's how they gain control. They also start investing in the Telegraph, but it's not just a matter of investments. It's a matter of weakening patent rights mm and getting preferential access. So mm -hmm. that law, New York Telegraph Act of 1848, modeled on the New York Free Banking Act of 1838, is an anti-monopoly law to encourage mm -hmm. new rival, and it does. Yeah. You have this scramble in the 1850s to get, the, the, the key communication arc goes from Liverpool to Halifax, which was of course part of the British Dominion, and then down through Maine, to Boston 
and New York. And that was more, and you could get this, the canard steamships can get you all the way to Halifax. And that's where the telegraph kicks in originally. And then they run the, they run the telegraph all the way up to Newfoundland. But then there's lots of competing lines there. So there's a great deal of speculation and a great deal of, um, of contention. And that's a direct result of the New York Telegraph Act of 1848 and the sister acts that follow it. And the, the, the final anti-monopoly act that shapes the telegraph is, well, there's two of them, but the, the, the most important is the National Telegraph Act of 1866. And Chandler and McCraw don't say a word about it. It's missing from the huh. history books. Um, and, and in fact, Robert Luther Thompson doesn't talk about the National Telegraph Act. He just, you know, they, he just assumes that it's a natural monopoly, which it most certainly was not. And yeah. interestingly enough, and this is very well documented, the godfather of the National Telegraph Act in 1866 was an Ohio congressman named John Sherman, hmm. who is the same fellow who we give credit for the Sherman Act of 1890, which really he didn't have much to do with in terms of its final form. He was certainly active in Congress debating it. But the 1866 Act is an anti-monopoly act, and it has, it has, it's a remarkable piece of legislation. You have to agree to its provisions in order to take advantage of what it offers. Okay, so it's contractual. What are its provisions? Well, you have to agree that Congress can buy you out within five years. Huh. The committee of five, one chosen by the companies, one, uh, two chosen by the companies, two chosen by uh, the government, and the fifth may be chosen by the other four. In other words, the mechanism. 1860, so it, that's why the Postal Telegraph issue starts up in 71. It's five years after the 66 law. Okay, so that's provision number one. So provision number two, we uh, can get you access to railroad rights of way, so Congress says. It turns out it doesn't work out as, as, as easily as they would hope. But every telegraph company, including in the end, Western Union, signs up. Western Union doesn't want to sign up for reasons I want to, I want to talk about in a minute. The third provision is that the government can send its messages over the telegraph at very, very low rates. And that's probably the most consequential because you know what that creates? That creates the institutional infrastructure for weather reporting. That weather reporting is very, very expensive. But if the government is in effect footing the bill, by, well, by, is, is the government footing the bill? No. The government is forcing the companies to send the information at low rates. The government, in effect, is establishing the rate yeah. structure. That's what I mean to say. Um, that that then makes it possible for the signal service and eventually the weather bureau to circulate information. And the companies huh. don't like that at all, but it, <laughs> it happens. Yeah. And then beginning in 1871, Ulysses S. Grant reads the law. Of course, the government should nationalize the telegraph. It's what happened in France. It's what happened in Britain. It's what happened in every yeah. civilized country. We should, we should nationalize the telegraph, too. And then there's a battle over the nationalization of the telegraph that goes on, uh, well, for the next, almost the next 20 years. And then there's another second provision known as the Butler Amendment that comes about in 1879. But the National Telegraph Act should be as well known as the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887 or the Sherman Act of 1890. But it's not because mm -hmm. following Chandler and McCraw, we always assume that regulation is reactive instead of being constitutive. And it's constitutive. Mm -hmm. It's there right from the beginning. And I could, well, there's, yeah. a lot, there's a lot more to say about the consequences of the National Telegraph Act. And it bears directly on the kind of blockbuster inventions of the 1870s that um, you know you know so well. But I'll, I'll stop there so, and let you ask another question. So, so um you know, you have this history, you know, at this point, you're talking about a 20 year history of anti-monopoly laws, basically. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's only like a couple of years. I mean, this is like, you know, it's in the 1870s or something that this natural monopoly idea right. really develops. So, like, how do how do we get from this this strong anti-monopoly moment to this idea that, you know, these utilities you know, and intuning communication systems kind of have a so-called natural monopoly? Great. So you'll let me tell my story. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, the concept natu of, of, of natural monopoly is popularized in the 1880s by Richard Ely, 1887, uh, Henry Carter, Aben Carter Adams, it's about the same time. That's when you first see it. And the concept of a freestanding public utility 
In other words, a water company is a public utility emerges mm -hmm. after the panic of 93. So let's get us now from 1866 to 1881. Those are the key dates. Well, I've said we got the five-year period, government ownership, 1871. Now what happens? Well, you're going to get bills in Congress for the government to take over the telegraph. You're also going to get reformers who say, well, no, we don't want the government to take over the telegraph. We want to have a rival company, a postal mm -hmm. telegraph company that will make the telegraph accessible to ordinary people as Western Union was not. Western Union was for the 1%. The post office was for, uh, for the multitudes, right? The post mm -hmm. office and not Western Union was the Victorian Internet. Okay. But here's what, this is what's so ingenious about this as a historian. You've got a law that says that after five years, from 1871 on, every company that signed on to the National Telegraph Act can be bought out. That includes Western Union. Western Union signed on, I am convinced, because they were fearful that they were going to lose property rights, their property in the South, because under, recon under congressional reconstruction, the status of property of out-of-state corporations was uncertain. Okay? So even Western, so everybody signed on. So that's the game. Now, there's a speculator named, and he, he was a speculator, and that's how he made his money, named Jay Gould, who recognizes that if an industry is structured very much by government regulation, political fiat, he can make a lot of money. That was true for the Erie Railroad. That was true for gold after the Civil War. And that was true for Telegraph, because it is structured by this anti-monopoly law. So how can you make a lot of money? Well, Gould figures it out. If you start up a rival company to Western Union, that will drive down the price of Western Union shares. And he sets up such a company in 1875, right after Western Union builds its big headquarters in New York City, one of the first great skyscrapers in the world. He sets up a rival company. Ah, ha, ha, drive down the price of Western Union shares. If you float a bill in Congress, to the effect that, well, wait a minute, Congress wants to take over Western Union. That'll drive up the price of Western Union shares because they're undervalued. They're supposed to sell at par, and most of the time they're selling around 30. So all you have to know is which way is the market <laughs> going to move. doesn't yeah. matter which way it moves. You can make a great deal of money. And Gould does. Hmm. William Orton, who is the president of Western Union, is a very capable guy. He was the son of a bookseller. He, he'd helped raise taxes during the Civil War. He's a hard driving businessman who dies of apoplexy trying to save Western Union in the midst of this controversy. He then enters into a bidding war with Gould for technical devices that will improve the efficiency of the telegraph network provider. So you've got now Gould versus Orton fighting over what we today call intellectual property. And there are three guys who get into this contest. One of them is named Gray, Elijah Gray. Another one is named Edison, Thomas Edison, the Thomas Edison. And the third is Alexander Graham Bell, the Alexander Graham Bell. And they're both inventing devices to sell either to Gould or to Orton, either to Western Union or to Gould's rival company the shell company. Uh, and out of this comes four blockbuster inventions in very short order. First, you get broadband telegraphy, send four messages over a wire called the quad, or maybe even more. First two, then four. They really started with four. And that was one of Edison's big uh, breakthrough inventions. Second invention that comes about, once you start experimenting with multiple messages, you know, multiple telegraphy, you begin to think a little bit about sound and transmitting sound over wire. And that's where Alexander Graham Bell and Edison come together to in, invent what would be the telephone. Now, there's other people involved with the telephone, but they're at the center of this because their patents then become very lucrative. So you got the broadband telegraph, you got the telephone. You've got a crippling problem with the telephone that's recognized immediately by Edison. And that is, is that the telephone does not record. Now, it turns out, <laughs> what do we say today? That was a, a feature and not a bug for Bell. They didn't want they didn't want the telephone to record, it turns out. Uh -huh. But initially, Edison said it'll never be credible for business purposes if it doesn't record. So 
he invents a recording device, which would become eventually the record player or sound recording. You know, it wasn't a record at the time. So, and then the fourth that comes out of it, Edison makes so much money, his first 20 patents, certainly the first 15 patents, are all telegraph related. Makes a fair amount of money, invests it in his uh, research and development lab, and comes up with the electric power station. So all four of those inventions, broadband, telephone, uh, sound recording, and the, uh, and, and the electric power station are a result of this anti-monopoly struggle between huh. Orton and Gould that is direct result of National Telegraph Act of 1866. Now, what about natural monopoly? Well, <laughs> um, January 1881, the business community of New York City wakes up to the discovery that Jay Gould has taken over Western Union. And, and boy, oh boy, was that a shock because he's a rival, he's an outsider, but now he's assaulted the temple. And what's he going to do? Is he going to speculate in Western Union? Is he going to speculate in other shares? Is he going to use his control over Western Union in order to, uh, in effect, manipulate? It's the same sort of concerns we have about Amazon today, using the information it gathers against yeah. others. These were the arguments that were made about Jay Gould in 1881. And that set off a new series, a much more intense series of, of public controversies and debates over Postal Telegraph, which culminates in 1887 with Ely declaring that the Telegraph is a natural monopoly. The reason he declared it a natural monopoly was not because of anything technical about the Telegraph. It's because so long as it's a political football, it's going to be a speculative darling and that that's bad. It's going to be corrupt. So in effect, by calling it a natural monopoly, you are getting it out of politics. It's not necessarily the nature of technology, but if the government takes it over, which Ely believed it should, it'll be less political. We tend not to think of that this day. Today, if the government takes something over, it'll make it more political. No, he said it'd be less political because they all saw how corrupt the telegraph politics was because of the ease with which you could buy up lawmakers at the federal and state level, manipulate patent rights, and in effect, um, in effect, distort markets. That's how we got natural monopoly. That's great. I, I love the um, rundown, Richard. Um, I want to turn to telephones now. I mean, I feel like this is a, a good place to do it. And, um, you know, one thing I, I really appreciate about Network Nation is that, you know, whereas other earlier histories of telephones are often focused on the Bell system mm -hmm. and, and long distance phone calls, your initial focus in the story is really about cities. And in, in localities. So what do we get by focusing at that level instead of like this higher system level? Great question. Um, virtually all the literature had been about uh, Bell System and nationwide. And that in part, uh, or if not in large part, is because that's how Bell sold itself. It was a public relations strategy to mm. identify the company with transcontinental telephony, with well, the vacuum too, with the miracles of modern science. But the, the transcontinental telephony was absolutely irrelevant to profits or business strategy at Bell. Um, and I, I just put it as strong terms as I can. McDougall and I both agree completely about that. And it's been so distorting that we haven't understood that. The big money in telephone was in cities. Mm -hmm. And uh, cities uh, were pretty dense. In Chicago, around 1902, I was just writing this somewhere else, the average length of a telephone call was about 3.1 miles or something. I've got the detail in. In, in other words, this mm -hmm. is this is a, you know, you could hire a messenger. I mean, this is yeah. local. Now, in the cities, right from the beginning, the companies are regulated because you have to tear up the yeah. streets and you have to put wires overhead. So rights of way become absolutely critical. So you have yeah. the you have this dynamic that if you get a right of way, then you have to give something. And what you have to give is access over maximum rates or access mm -hmm. over certain kind of privileges for this group or that group. So they, it's politically contested from day one. There's no anti-monopoly moment, but there is a progressive logic in that the companies are supposed to perform better. If only to prevent... <laughs> the managers from being extorted by the city alderman. Because if you're in a city like Chicago <laughs> or New York, and yeah. you can, in effect, shake down the telephone company every time they want to move into a new district, 
you that's a that's nice work if you can get it. And that's what <laughs> happens in New York and Chicago and many yeah. other cities. And that is so obvious to the telephone companies. Right. Um, they are being extorted. And, and well, they machine also, politics are politics too, Richard. Yeah, very much. <laughs> Um, and and that's out of that's the the setting, out yeah. of which the companies. And then I make this kind of counterintuitive argument about Chicago, which is my case study. The records are best for Chicago. There's the most debate in Chicago, um, and I happen to be living in Chicago. Yeah. So um, in the 1890s, this fellow Angus Hibbert becomes the general manager, and he repudiates his predecessor Charles Norman Fay. Charles Norman Fay basically said. That if you don't like our telephone service, just go somewhere else. Go away. You know, no <laughs> one tells Marshall Field what he can charge for his goods. We're going to charge whatever we want. This is a guy, Charles Norman Fay, who ended up the last 30 years of his life living in the Harvard Faculty Club, regaling the, uh, you know, the East Coast uh, uh, twits with stories about his, his wild days in Chicago. All right. <laughs> he doesn't believe the telephone. So he just it's going to be a business. We're going to run it for these guys who can afford it. Yeah. These guys are, you know, they're just uh, plutocrats. And of course, they can, yeah. they can pay for it. He, he, at one point, he gave an address in which he called the telephone users knights of labor. You know, in other words, <laughs> they were kind of radicals because they were complaining about the company. And that was considered to be so insurrectionary that a lot of editors printed it wrong intentionally. But anyway, that's a digression. So you've got the old world with Charles Norman Fay and the new world with Angus Hibbert. And Hibbert, He's the kind of guy who likes to invent songs for the telephone company officials to sing, you know, or Chicagoans oh, wow. to sing. And he really yeah. believes in esprit de corps. And he wants to make the telephone more accessible. And yeah. he wants to make it more accessible in part to create a political block that can successfully challenge the alderman. Yeah. Right? It is a political calculus here as well as an economic calculus because expanding the size of the network is very expensive. You get more people mm -hmm. using the network and then your call connection delay is going to increase. Mm -hmm. And if your call connection delay increases, you're going to have an awful lot of unhappy, awful lot of unhappy users. But mm -hmm. he's willing to do it. And he, he goes up against the city council to shift from flat rate to measured service. Flat rate makes it virtually impossible for ordinary people to get access. And they experiment them with something very novel, well, which we, well, you know, no one's heard of it anymore. There used to be something called a pay telephone. He called yeah. it a nickel in, the nickel in the slot. So you put a nickel in, you have no more commitment, you can make a phone call. And, about, and, and this has led to an incredible expansion in, in uh, access to telephone, numbers of telephone. I write about this in some detail. And they begin to market. They begin to advertise. They, so, they begin, yeah. so that's I think a, that a political strategy to expand the network. Yeah. I mean, I think that with the telegraph, I think we have, even in popular culture, some image of how this thing worked, right? You got yeah. wires along the railroad, the there's messages going. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, when we think of the phone, we think of this consumer facing technology that's in households. That's where it ends up in the in the yeah. 20th century. But like where where are people using these things? You know, where are yeah. they getting access to them? This is important because the eminent sociologist Claude Fisher made the claim that I think is just dead wrong, that the telephone was popularized by kind of the housewives of California, the women mm -hmm. living in suburbs in California who gossiped. Mm -hmm. And my claim, no, in fact, the gossips in the telephone network in the 1890s were the office boys talking about baseball and prize fights. <laughs> and that they were working in the exchanges where you had the problem because those were the congested downtown exchanges. There weren't any women mm. in those congested downtown exchanges, and they certainly weren't gossiping. And remember, mm. you could only have one person on a line at a time. So you're going to get a lot of unhappy users yeah. if they're long calls. So they, they try to demonize the office clerks, but that kind of pisses off the bosses who are paying the bills. So then they go after women for, as mm. gossips. But the even there's not even that much discussion of women because they're not in those downtown districts. So yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's jobbing lumber. It's uh, to get information about, uh, about uh, market trends. It's, yeah. it's, it's instrumental. That's, what, that's where they saw the money was. And the trouble was, though, the way it was set up, they don't have any good way to keep somebody off the line. Yeah. It, because it's, it's a flat rate. So then they shift from flat rate over to um, measured service where they where they charge by the call 
And that's important. Because there's another just absolutely essential fact about the telephone that may not be obvious. It wasn't obvious to me when I started, which is that every single telephone before the First World War, every single telephone call in the Bell Network, which was the dominant network, which is the big city, they control the big cities, New York and Chicago. They have competition in Philadelphia, but New York and Chicago control those two cities. Every single telephone call has to be connected by a human being, which is mm-hmm. a, a, a telephone operator who is a woman in this on a switchboard. Um, and, and you can imagine as this network gets bigger, your arms have to get longer and it's harder to put those wires. You have to physically link wires together. Um, and with off, off on our telephone calls, that's a, that's a problem. And, and so that's how it became popularized. It wasn't driven by consumers. Mm-hmm. It was driven by politi- a political calculation in order to challenge the alderman. And, and the, mm. the, around 1900, that's a convenient year, 1900, new, new, new um, century, um, around that moment in time, the telephone companies in Chicago and New York will claim access to telephone as a right and not a privilege. So that's the first electrically mediated communication huh. medium to be uh, reconfigured for the entire population instead of an exclusive clientele. No one at Western Union ever said that. Hmm. No one. So in, unless you have that perspective of what was before yeah. and what was later, that moment is, is just as important as the early 2000s, really, hmm. for, for the social media, Internet. That was the moment. Now, not everybody had a telephone. No. Yeah, right. But the, the presumption was that access is to be a right, that anyone in the city can get some kind of access to telephone. Mm-hmm. Before we kind of go on to talk about AT&T and universal service, I wanted to ask you, I mean, you know, a big a idea that's been very really hot for the last couple of decades is disruptive innovation and yeah. disruption and all these kinds of things, you know new technologies come and blow the old ones out of the water. So I imagine when the telephone came around, it like instantaneously killed the telegraph, right? <laughs> no, not at all. They were in, com- they were in complementary markets. Uh, I mean, that by the First World War, the revenue of the telephone finally equals the post office. That's the 800-pound gorilla. Western mm-hmm. Union never has revenue more than a third of the post office. But they were seen as complementary. In fact, think of the name uh, of the acronym AT&T, the name of the company, American Telephone and Telegraph. The great vision of Theodore Vail, who was the president of Bell in uh, 1910, his vision was that we, he bought up Western Union the year before, that we are going to have low cost, short distance telephone messages and low cost, long distance Mm. telegraph messages. So the two are going to work together. And that inner linking of telegraph and telephone, he called universal service. I don't know, it's like Facebook and Messenger coming together, right? And then the the Supreme Court said in 1914, no way, you got to, or or they they have a quarrel and Bell gives up the telegraph. So it loses, it loses its T. In mm-hmm. 1914, never got its tea back. So they were complementary, different services. Now, the telephone was not only a consumer service, but the telegraph was not a consumer service. They mm-hmm. try with singing telegrams and that sort of thing. <laughs> it's never, yeah. it's never yeah. really an important part of the telegraph market. Whereas the telephone had to serve these different markets, and eventually the telephone will overtake Western Union. Mm-hmm. But remember, Western Union is still linked with the overseas cables, which is where mm. all the price information is coming from, right? So that, yeah. that gives Western Union a, uh, a lifeline. There's a second company called Postal Telegraph, too. That gives them a lifeline. So no, the new innovation does not immediately disrupt and destroy. You can think of what happened with Samuel Colt. He thought the newspaper would be obsolescent. It wasn't yeah. obsolescent. They, they don't, the new media tends not to destroy the old media. They tend to work symbiotically together. One of the few that's ever really disappeared is the telegraph. Which I think had it. I think the last telegraph message was something around 2000. But no, they tend yeah. to work together, and the disruption is as much a byproduct of politics and culture as it is of technology and economics. <laughs> Amen. Um, so you know, at, at this point, w- when we talk about Vale, and we, you know, Vale really does start to stitch together these different mm-hmm. Bell systems, and, and you know, 
creates what we think of as the bell system in, in, yep. in a lot of ways. Where where has the monopoly tradition gone by this point? You know, I mean, this is the, the, the early 20th century moment is when antitrust laws are you know, a big deal. The anti-monopoly tradition seems to be going really well, but it doesn't seem to have you know sunk its teeth into this. So what what happened? Well, make a long story short, Vail came out of the post office. He'd been the superintendent of the railway mail service, and he greatly admired the post office. And he never believed in competition. He mm -hmm. wanted to have one integrated network providing what he called universal service. And by 1907, inside the big cities, having nothing to do with Vail, the business elites and the politicians had reached the same consensus. We should have just one telephone operating company in the city. So by 1907, the possibility of vigorous competition in the telephone market, in my view, is finished. Robert McDougall has a somewhat different rendering of this. You can compare the two books. 1907. And the, the idea was, and by the way, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of non-Bell operating companies. And there were some big ones. Uh, uh, Buffalo was a non-Bell company, uh, or there was a big non-Bell company. Rochester had a non-Bell company. Um, Iowa, uh, Nebraska. Lincoln, Nebraska had one of the most successful. So you got you got the two you got rivalry between them, but after 1907, it's very difficult for the independents to get financing, and that mm -hmm. is the reason, the rationale for the antitrust suit against Bell that ends in 1914 with this settlement. I think it's 1914, 1314, with a settlement that um, has been misleadingly called the Kingsbury Commitment because the historians let Bell Public Relations tell the story. Year after year, people repeat the Kingsbury Commission. <laughs> it's the McReynolds settlement. It's the attorney general, the same guy who broke up Standard Oil and American Tobacco, or he'd been in, involved in those two mm -hmm. uh, suits, who, who forces Bell to disgorge Western Union. So you have separations between mm -hmm. telephone and telegraph with the McReynolds settlement. Now, that does not end the pressure for hostile regulation of Bell. There's a big government ownership movement, and the government briefly takes over Bell in the First World War, but Bell wises up. They invent corporate public relations, as Roland Marchand shows. They invent it, a whole new uh, genre, in order to convince the world that they are technologically innovative, that they're going to be the best steward of the public will, they're going to be just like the post office. And by the way, we invented vacuum tube and trans, especially transcontinental mm. telephone. They didn't mm -hmm. really focus on the vacuum tube in their advertising. Mm. But we are the best steward of public welfare. So, and, and we're not a private enterprise. And furthermore, shareholders are not, a, we want lots of shareholders. They'll get a, they'll get a, a set uh, percentage, but they're not going to be in charge. We're not going to run this like Jay Gould. We're not going to yeah. have any melon cutting. There's going to be no big dividends mm -hmm. for the insiders. In effect, the shareholders and the investors are cut out of Bell, and the management takes over in the First World War. And that is the, the moment in which managerial capitalism, in my view, is born. And that's very different from Al Chandler, who said it was with the railroads in the 1850s. Yeah. It's born, managerial capitalism is a response to a political crisis caused by the anti-monopoly movement of the progressive era. That, that's putting it you know, yeah. in, in very schematic terms. But that's what happened. And Bell yeah. avoided it. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get the Bell system and, and you know, the whole history of the 20th century telecommunications. So, I mean, after this book, you you have turned to a, a big history of anti-monopoly thinking in the U.S., right, going all the way back. And I feel yes. like, you know, in many ways, your your career has kind of pointed towards that the whole time, I think, from the post office through this book. Uh, you know, anti-monopoly is such a big topic. So so what what is that looking like these days? What's what's the plan here? The plan is to ask the question, what did certain Americans, I'm not going to do all Americans, there's too many yeah. of them, what did certain Americans think about monopoly in the Enlightenment, then several points in the 19th century, and then probably right up through the 1950s and 1960s. And okay. the, the argument looks like this. Uh, let's just go to the progressive era, because that's what I've done 
to work on so far, as I said, the early 20th century. For the founders, the monopoly that loomed the largest was not the East India Company, but it British commercial monopoly. It was the mm-hmm. British government. And, yep. and that way, once we were, <laughs> when we were under the control of British, under their yeah. umbrella, that was great. But suddenly we <laughs> right. were not, that was a big problem. Mm-hmm. So the British commercial monopoly. And that fighting the British commercial monopoly will lead to debates over the tariff. And, and then the argument was, we don't want the British to undercut our producers because they pay their workers terribly because they're all starving in hovels. So we've got to keep our, uh, you've got to keep our, uh, level the playing field by keep the tariff rates up. Yeah. All right. So that's the first current. The second current was, com- and that's one that's not well known to historians at all. It's been a big, big surprise, but it has all kinds of implications. The second current emerges in the 1840s and it goes back, well, it goes back to the English Civil War, which is that ordinary people should have a right, God-given, to what they need to establish a competency or or, or autonomy. And and what do they need? Well, they need land and they need education. So there's the second anti-monopoly movement focuses on land. And it's a Mm -hmm. remarkable chapter in American history that goes from the 1840s, uh, well, right up to natural debates over natural resources in the progressive era. We, hmm. uh, Theodore Roosevelt, you do not will will say you do not want private land uh, owned by the government. You don't want land owned by the government with mineral mm-hmm. rights to be privatized, because mm-hmm. that's going to be a monopoly of some of of some. That was what the Pinchot affair was about. The Ballinger Pinchot affair under under Taft. Will the Guggenheims and the Morgans get control over? coal reserves in yep. Alaska. No, they shouldn't. So that's that's the land arc. And then mm-hmm. the third arc is, this is just a progressive era because the book's going to go further. Um, this is what I've been working on. The third arc is the more familiar story about industry yeah. um, that, that begins with, well, the state antitrust and then Sherman. But the, the point of Sherman Act, but what I'm trying to make, the point I'm trying to make there is that it's nothing to do with consumer welfare or consumer surveillance. Yeah. <laughs> that the goal is instead to promote a certain vision of a moral economy in which you have competition. And if you don't have competition, yeah. then you have regulation or ownership. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and that's Lippmann and Brandeis are two of the figures I'm writing about. And they're not as different as you'd suppose, because mm-hmm. the idea is we're going to control monopoly. In the mid-19th century with a land issue, the idea was we could contain it. If we do not have monopoly in land, says Henry George, who's a major figure, a neglected figure, political economy, he was the most read economist perhaps of all time. Um, if we can contain it, if we can tax the landlords, then we'll eliminate monopoly. And of course, for the founders, for John Adams, the goal was we've got to find a way to contest it. We've got to mm-hmm. keep monopoly overseas. We've got to keep it out of our out of our hands. So that was the arc. But all three of those movements. Um, I, I don't like to call it a single tradition, visions, if you will. Mm-hmm. How should we have a, what, what should be the good society? All three of them presuppose that monopoly is fundamentally a political question. And in the 20th century, you're going to shift to it being a technical issue. Yeah. You're also going to shift to a focus on the government becoming the monopoly mm. and not the corporation. Um, now you have special privilege, admittedly, in the early Republic yeah. of the land, but there's a there's that second shift, and that's a shift then that occurs with the rise of um, well, there's a lot of things that happen in the 20th century. It's about bureau. It's it's your first paper on Bartleby, right? It's right. it's the worry about bureaucracy <laughs> and you know, <laughs> you really have bureaucratic. <laughs> this really bureaucratic fatalism kicks in in a big yeah, way. Yeah, exactly. In the second World <laughs> War, and that that's right. I hadn't thought of that. That transforms the debate over monopoly. And, and yeah. Ayn Rand is involved and Bork is involved. And yeah, yeah. Marxists are involved. A whole different group of people thinking about monopoly in very, very different ways. I know you got to go in a second, but I wanted to just ask you quickly. I Am I right that you're a part of the group that's trying to kind of raise questions about mon- monopoly and antitrust now in the States? Yes. I mean, I'm, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm a, how would you say? I'm a historian, but I yeah. I, I taught a course with uh, Matt Stoller, 
who, who has a very uh, fine newsletter and the Economic Liberties Project. He's done a lot of great work. And yeah, I'm, I'm uh, that might be what I'm thinking of. You're like, I yeah. think you're on that website, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. on his advisory council. I'm friends, okay. with, Barry, I'm friends with Barry Lynn, um, who, of course, helped to really get the ball rolling. He was a key figure in the promotion early on of Lena Khan and the idea of the new Brandeisians. So, yes, I do work with those folks. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I guess I see my role as to convince anyone who will listen that anti-monopoly is not antitrust. It's, it's much huh. bigger. It's much older. And it's yeah. much more variegated. And let's not leave out the radicals. Uh, why do we ignore figures like Henry George, for example, who was the most important uh, radical connected with the anti-monopoly movement in the 19th century? As a historian, uh, that seems to me to be bizarre. Now, I can yeah. see why a journalist or a political strategist would um, reach a different conclusion. But it doesn't make any sense to me as a historian or to leave out uh, mm. the idea of Britain as a, as a commercial monopoly. Or to yeah. emphasize the similarities, say, between Herbert Hoover and Louis Brandeis. All those things. Um, I don't see it as a as a Manichaean people versus the interest, Hamilton versus hmm. the struggle. That just doesn't make sense of the historical record. And that's where I'm that that's where I'm in the kind of a creative tension with certain of my friends in the anti yeah. activist community. Well, I mean, I was gonna ask you, I mean, I think that, you know, there we can just go we should do this together sometime. Just look for all the books that have big in the title, I mean, I think Stoller, you know, it's just like we're living this moment where like, you know, anti-monopoly, there's a lot of people who think monopoly is a big part of our economic problem right now. Right. Uh, well, I, I mean, one thing I'll say is that in the 1870s and 80s, the populace didn't think the railroads were too big. They thought they were too small. Uh -huh. um, and, and, and the idea that small is beautiful was yeah. just not what 19th I mean, you know, unless yeah. you think, you, yes, farmers should own their own land. Yeah. But the, the, the small is beautiful came in in the early 20th century following the great merger movement. And it, you know, Brandeis will say, I'm not opposed to bigness. I'm opposed to monopoly. And, and, yeah. and Wilson says the same, says the right. same thing. And if it's efficient, it can be big. But they did yeah. have a conception of large scale enterprise playing within rules. They believed it should be segmented. They believed in municipal uh, regulation. They, state regulation um, yeah and, and and they and they believed in common the idea of common carriage um which is not net neutrality it's, mm -hmm. it's a different principle and and now you've got a situation where amazon and google in effect are not only operating in the marketplace they're trying to become the market yeah yeah um, and that is different so i can see why the anti-bigness um argument is yeah um, so resonant today but that's not the only or even the most important strain it's anti-domination and you can yeah be yeah i like that you can be dominated in a small setting yep women for example concerned about men beating mm. their wives sure that's a monopoly issue that's a domination issue but it's not a big business issue yes. so I, I just wish my friends in the anti-monopoly <laughs> community would, would see this as a bigger more important yeah. more consequential issue than they're inclined I'm with you to yeah. and then they get off the idea that everything's going to change if we have a, if we have this big blockbuster yes. antitrust suit. Antitrust I, suits are fine, yeah. all for them, but it, the problem is more serious. Yeah, That's what I would I'm say. with you. I mean, I think, so I, I mean, we should talk about this more sometime, but my big question is, I think there's just deeper economic problems that this bigness stuff just doesn't touch. And sometimes when they overplay the monopoly card, you know, they act like that's our big economic problem. And I, I just think there's lots of issues around technology and growth and, and other things that just aren't about monopoly. Not that monopoly can't kind of negatively affect them, but it's there's deeper issues there. And so I worry that sometimes it's a distraction, I, I think is my right, but that, you know it's, it's an interesting question. If you're a journalist or an activist or you're yeah. mobilizing, it, you'll you'll pick a particular strategy. And there's yeah. no question that there is a major problem or a set of problems today yep. that, that there are affinities with what happened in the progressive era and to a certain extent what happened in the 1930s but yes my inclination is is this is a much more serious problem and that in fact we've thought about monopoly which is what i'm writing about much more creatively than we do today or have um at least certainly in the 
in, in the recent past, and that we we need to educate uh, ourselves, our mm. students, and lawmakers about the embeddedness of economic activity in political regime dominant and which shaped by governmental institutions and civic ideals. You cannot escape that. And if you do create a world in which the corporations are uh, more or less independent players, then we're right back to the Middle Ages and the Imperial <laughs> Imperium. Richard, there's no better way to wrap it up than right there. <laughs> right back to the Middle Ages. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time today, Richard. This was this was as great as I thought it would be. <laughs> well, I really enjoyed it, Lee. And I, I, I would say that I'm so impressed by your work. And I'm going to be teaching the maintainers this fall in the graduate course. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of our podcast. Peoples and things like most things in this world depends on the work of many people. I want to thank my brother Jake Vinsel for writing the music for the show. I want to thank my buddy Juliana Castro for designing the logos for the podcast. You can check out our work at julianacastro.co. Peoples and Things is a production of Virginia Tech Publishing and the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. Production activities are supported by the Athenaeum, a space in the library that acts as a hub for digital humanities, teaching, learning, and creation. Joe Ford is the Athenaeum coordinator and digital humanities specialist at VT Libraries, and he serves as producer and sound engineer for the podcast. For information about other podcasts from Virginia Tech Publishing, visit publishing.vt.edu. I also want to thank you for listening. Thanks.